It's dirty. It's crowded. There's always a strike. The waiters are rude. And it's the place to go in 2024. Hello, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Welcome to a special edition we're calling Paris in 2024. As the French capital gets set to host the Olympics for the first time in exactly 100 years, we'll ask why, for better or for worse, old stereotypes stick about the city of light. With Olympic events designed to showcase the grandeur of Paris's historical sites, we'll ask how a 2,000-year-old urban area is evolving today. Is the world's top tourist destination thriving or losing its soul? Joining us for this special edition, Alexandre Faure, Associate Researcher in Urban Studies at the School of Advanced Studies in Social Science, EHESS. Your forthcoming book that you co-edited is called Olympic Games in Global Cities. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks. He sells the dream every day. Bertrand Dalmont, co-founder of My Private Paris. You show off Paris to tourists. Exactly. Uh, from where? Well, all over the world, but mostly from uh, English-speaking countries. Mostly from English-speaking countries. And uh, I see you're big on Instagram. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Madeleine Schwartz, uh, who is uh, the editor-in-chief of the digital news magazine The Dial. Uh, you, uh, for the New York Review of Books, discussed not terror attacks, not bed bugs, uh, but rats. And in a nation where arguing uh, the national sport, Madeleine found both the pro and anti-rodent crowd. We'll talk maybe about that in a moment. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, he is just in time for the game's journalist Stephen Clark's favorite confused Englishman in Paris is back. Your character, Paul West's latest adventure, Merde at the Paris Olympics. No spoilers, please, but <laughs> what brings him to the Olympics? Well, well, he's English, but strangely, in the novel, he starts helping some French people to campaign to get pétanque adopted as um, an Olympic sport, which... As an Englishman, I find a complete scandal that it's not an Olympic sport in Paris. Right, indeed, indeed. At least a demonstration. It's the most French thing on the planet, pétanque. You know? <laughs> Booze and sport. That's right. That's French. <laughs> well, and all throughout the year, by the way, you can uh, react on the hashtag World This Week. We'll always have Paris, Humphrey Bogart tells Ingrid Bergman in the Hollywood classic Casablanca. What was true in 1942 still holds true in 2023. Oh, sure. The U.S. movie and film industry has a certain idea of the French capital with the same a red beret seen in the hit Netflix series Emily in Paris, now featuring alongside miniature Eiffel Towers and Mona Lisa keychains uh, at a, a stall uh, uh, near uh, you. Uh, they still flock to Paris, despite the rats, despite that recent bed bug scare. Uh, how serious is uh, the uh, how serious is the problem? Uh, very slight, as usual, insist authorities who suspect a scheme by the Anglo-Saxon press which in point of truth was always more worried about the shoddy crowd control at the 2022 Champions League final at the Stade de France than about the bed bugs. Madeleine Schwartz, are, are you worried about bed bugs? You know, I think if you were to trust uh, the local press here in Paris, there would be so much to worry about, whether it's uh, bed bugs or the rats. And yet what's so interesting, especially about some of these vermin, is how little it is that is truly known about them. I spent uh, several weeks following two different kinds of rat catchers here in the capital. On the one hand, a group called Projet Armageddon, who are a group of scientists who are seeking... Armageddon Project. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose the name, uh, but it's very evocative, I would say. And these groups of scientists have been trying to understand the Paris rat, uh, understand where they live, how far they travel, how many of them there are. This is a question that actually no one can really answer. And on the other hand, I followed a group called Khalubol, which means fed up, but is also a pun on the word rat, rat. Uh, who are a group of vigilante anti-rat um, activists who have been going and uh, killing rats as they see fit around Paris. What you're describing is very much a local news story, and yet the New York Review of Books... Uh uh, trumpeted it on their front page. Uh, what does that tell you about, uh, obviously, your great writing, but, uh, but how much Paris matters, uh, how much Paris sells magazines? Well, you know, I think especially to an English-speaking audience, Paris is a, an iconic city, a city that is hugely representative of so many people's dreams and aspirations. You know, it's, it's no luck that, it's, it's no big surprise that 
Emily did not go to Berlin, but to Paris. Um, the, the truth is that many of the problems that Paris has are shared by many big cities, whether it's New York or London, uh, but I think they take on a special flavor when they uh, happen in this, in this city. Alexandre Fort, what keeps you up at night? Is it bed bugs? Is it rats? Is it terror attacks? Is it, uh, what is it? Nothing special. <laughs> in fact, uh, <laughs> Everything's perfect in Paris. No, evidently not. But um, it's not a catastrophe now. The city is working well. And um, what happened is the biggest problem now in Paris it can be in the transportation system and the delay we have. But it's not new. It's not only Paris. And American people know that from uh, Washington or New York. It's the same problematic. So I think, as you say, many global cities have the same problems. And Paris is not unique on this point. All right, we're going to talk about yeah. transport and how the city is changing in, in, in a short while. Um, yeah, the bad, bad publicity, does it, does it at all dent your business ever? Well, there's bad publicity is still good publicity in a way. Yeah. Um, and in this post-COVID era, the number of visitors uh, has gone back to normal, if I may say. So I'm not so sure that... All Same as events... before, bigger, less... Almost the same, okay. almost the same as 2019, which was a huge record year. And we, we see that people are eager to come and visit Paris, spend some time here. So I'm not so sure that all these um, so-called bad news have a big impact. Stephen Clark? Um, yeah, I think I mean, the thing about Paris is that even rats, I mean, there's a film, Ratatouille, about Parisian mm -hmm. rats. Even Parisian rats, because they're Parisian, they're not the same as other people's rats. It's like you know, the, we also have pigeons, horrible pigeon problem here, you know, loads of pigeons everywhere, which, which are kind of the rats. Every co-op meeting is all about pigeons. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, we have all of this, but at the same time, people find it charming. You know, I'm sure some tourists even like to take photos of the homeless people with their nice tents in the streets. You know, Paris is Paris, and therefore everything becomes kind of artistic, which, if you live here, can be quite maddening. But at the same time, it's quite flashing because... Almost everything we do, like not stopping at a red light or something, is, oh, my God, they're so Parisian. We're, we're sort of living the cliché dream, which, you know, Emily in Paris has helped a lot because she lives a load of and, clichés. And does that uh, amuse you or infuriate you? Um, both. I mean, it helps me to write books. You know, Mayor of the Paris Olympics is full of... It's real Paris. The thing about Paris is that you don't have to exaggerate it. You don't have to stoop to clichés and stereotypes because the real everyday life is completely... Fascinating, you know, the, and it's, it stays Parisian. People talk about, oh, Paris is losing its soul. I don't believe that at all. I live up in the north of Paris near the canal and there are all these fantastic new restaurants opening along the canal. It's becoming incredibly trendy, but they're all so Parisian. You know, the waiters and waitresses, they have tattoos and beards and they're just as unfriendly as someone with a white waistcoat, you know, but they're completely Parisian. They know everything about the wine they're serving. The chefs are young, again, bearded and tattooed and everything, but they're really great, really Parisian, old school Parisian food with all these vegetables. That so you do you prefer rude and plugged in or friendly and well, a little rough behind the edges? I mean, there's, we, there's, people say rude, I just say efficient. The Parisian waiters and waitresses, they are professionals. So if, if they have some amateur tourists come along and they, you know, they say to them, have you decided, do you know what you want? And then they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they open the menu and say, well, actually, uh, and the, you know, the waiter gets impatient because he or she is a, uh, is a professional and the, the tourists, the guests are amateurs. B Bertrand, do you aspire to a more professional class of tourists? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, well, we're also here to help them. I mean, I think it's part of what, what you're saying is they're so Parisian because they're different. Uh, they're used to maybe having, you know, waitresses and waiters who and do, take do, more do time. They, do they want to discover Paris or do they want to see the Paris they've found in their Instagram feed? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I can only talk about the one I guide, and if they choose to be guided, is they want to discover Paris. Uh, but it's true in some venues, like the Opera House, for instance, where we used to be just among guides and uh, people who wanted to uh, be guided. We now have to share the space with lots of uh, uh, people taking selfies and being dressed up for the occasion. So it's, I mean, Paris is iconic, not just for its history, but also for its look. So now we can all take photos all the time, I guess. It's a mix of those. But that's what's great. I find that great because Instagrammers, you know, you can have, you can go to somewhere like Montparnasse, you'll have three identical brasseries. 
but one of them will have like 300 people waiting outside taking selfies and the other two you can just go and get a table whenever you want the instagrammers are helping to concentrate tourists in certain places that we we parisians we can now see and we can avoid because we go to the ones that are just as good but have no instagrammers i've witnessed the same phenomenon in, in rome uh, alexandre fort it, 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 is that your experience? Every well? city has the same problem, in particular the global cities. If you look at Paris, we are always looking at the, the municipality of Paris, so the core central part of Paris. But we forget that 10 million of the, the, the Parisians uh, live outside of the Paris municipality. So the region of Paris is 13 million inhabitants. Paris alone is 2.2. 2.3, depending on the, the, the year. And uh, the majority of the people who live in, in the region didn't live what Emily in Paris lived. So it's uh, this image of Paris, the core central part of Paris with the Haussmannian uh, Avenue, with the, the, the monuments, are not the common uh, way to live in Paris. Just and, remind for our viewers yeah. what Haussmannian is, because that's an important uh, Haussmannian. concept. Haussmannian is, is an architectural style uh, made by uh, Haussmann when he was prefet of Paris, so when he managed uh, the, the agglomeration in terms of security, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, management. So and, it's an interior uh, it minister was... that shaped the landscape of Paris. Yes, but in the Napoleonian time. <laughs> so it was not a democracy at this time. And, and it, was, it was in charge to transform Paris to, to become the, the modern capital we know today. It was certainly the first modern capital. And he built, uh, he, he not built, but he, he designed a chart for a promoter, for builders to say, you need to follow a certain line of architecture. So he did didn't build exactly. He asked to the private to follow the line of the government in right. terms of architecture. At the turn of the 20th century, uh, differing social classes sometimes inhabited the same buildings in Paris with the vast apartments, those Haussmannian apartments that uh, Alexandre describes. Uh, uh, on the lower floors, this is the days before elevators, a contrast with the fifth floor walk-ups or the maids' quarters all the way up at the top. But there were also plenty of rougher neighborhoods, like the northeastern Menilmontant uh, Heights, just uh, captured in this 1956 photo by Edouard Bouba. That same year, the children's classic short film, The Red Balloon, was released. Uh, decades later, it, it's stark to see when you, when you watch The Red Balloon just how different uh, Paris, Paris is today from from a from a half century ago. That the inequality you could experience just through a walk across town, it's there, but you really have to go further now, Madeline Schwartz. Yes, well, I think as Alexandre was saying, you know, the biggest uh, inequalities and differences uh, are not really actually in in the city center of of Paris, but with between Paris and the surrounding suburbs or. Banlieue. I th one big misapprehension uh, people often have about the city of Paris is that it is indeed a, a city of the size of uh, New York, New York, or London. Actually, Paris itself is only um, about just over two million people, and I'm sure that Anne Hidalgo would not like to be compared to the mayor of Philadelphia. But that is the size of the city that she. Yeah, we, we, we can we can even call up graphics on that. Uh, Paris is small, and also its population, if we're talking about, the, is diminishing. There you see it compared with London uh, and Berlin. It was nearly 2.9 million on the eve of, uh, of World War I. It's steadily declining, uh, well inside, but that's just the administrative boundaries. Uh, it, the greater Paris region keeps growing. It's up to uh, nearly 11 million, and that makes it the largest urban area uh, in, uh, in, in all of Europe. Uh, and in a world where the high and mighty think nothing of buying a little pad uh, that's much cheaper than what they'd find for the same price in New York or London, that is pushing up, as you can see in this graph, uh, the, uh, the, um, that's pushing up uh, the prices of apartments and working class or middle class families getting pushed further out, Madeline. Exactly. And so this means that when we think about inequality in Paris, the inequality has really been uh, growing geographically, where it's less a question of a walk that you could do through Paris that would show you different um, f forms of of life, so much as a ever widening geographic scope, where people who have fewer means are being pushed further and further out from the center of the city. I think it's always very striking that the uh, administrative center of Paris is the wealthiest département in France, and Saint Denis, which is right. Uh, next door is the poorest in metropolitan France. This is a very striking example of inequality um, in the greater Paris region that many visitors to Paris don't see. Post-World War II, Alexandre Fort, uh, London, sees the urban sprawl. 
uh, announces this uh, this uh, green wall concept, a uh, green belt concept or, or around the city. Uh, here in Paris, uh, would you say now that we have the same sprawl that in, in, in London, if there's 11 million people in the greater Paris mm -hmm. area, people commuting long distances to get into the city center? It, it's more complex. Paris have always this uh, particularity to be so dense. So. Any cities in the world have a density at the core center, but Paris have a huge density and that other city didn't have. And particularly when you look at New York, we imagine New York as a very dense city, but it's less dense than Paris core center. Uh, we have some of the, the arrondissement of Paris where you have more than 40,000 uh, inhabitants per kilometer square. That is two times more than Manhattan in New York. And we don't have the skyline of Manhattan. So Paris has this specificity to be very, very dense. It's absolutely not large. It's, uh, it's not London. London is perhaps uh, six or four times larger than Paris in terms of Fast. So uh, the, the main problem in Paris is not really the question of the uh, distance, but the organization of the uh, transportation system that is made in star. So you are in obligation to come inside Paris, in the core center of Paris, to go in another suburbs when you come from one suburbs. And this is the particularity of Paris. You are in obligation to, 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 to pass by the, by the central part, and there is no link between suburbs. So the city of Paris is very dense, but at the same time, the system of transport is all, also concentrated in the central part. Stephen Clark, that, that, that difference, is it, do you see the way it's evolving? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I lived for a while in, in the Marais a long time ago, and in, right in this very medieval heart of Paris, which I remember back in the 80s, there were a few of these um, old sort of mansions, the Hôtel Particulier, which are now museums, which were empty. You know, it, the Marais was just getting going. But now, Marais is just clothes shops, and food shops and almost no one lives there. Um, what I do find quite admirable in Paris is that when new builds happen, especially when large buildings happen, there's a lot of social housing and student housing put into the building. I live right up in the northeast of Paris and there's a lot of new building going on and they always put social housing in there to try and keep a mix going. So I actually live in an area which is still very mixed. There are poor people, there are sort of people like me who you know have fancy jackets on and you know, drink expensive wine um, at restaurants and stuff. And, and it's, a big, it's a big mix. But I have seen in the centre of Paris now, in the Latin Quarter, you know, it used to be the student area. No student can live in the Latin Quarter. It's, you know, the Latin Quarter now is just American tourists and, and you know, Americans with second homes, basically. Um, Paris has been really, really intensely gentrified in the centre. Uh, and it has um, become, it looks the same, but it, the, the atmosphere has changed a lot. But, but outside that, Paris has still got, you know, because so many people live in Paris. It's not like in, in London, you know, after six o'clock, the only people you see are in the office workers in the pubs. There's, no one lives there in the centre of London. Whereas in Paris, you still get people in certain business areas around Opera and uh, further out. People live there, you know, a lot of people live there. So it's still, you know, sort of living, breathing, quite mixed city once you get out of the center. Does my private Paris, Bertrand Allemand, venture outside of the uh, ring road, the Boulevard Périphérique? Right. I'm not talking about outside of a trip to the Palace of Versailles, maybe, do you? <laughs> do you... <laughs> um, well, we used to have, uh, pre-COVID, we had a, a tour which is like a, a blind tasting menu, which was a uh, live the day like a Parisian, where we would take people on the metro and then we would end up in Montreuil and, or in other uh, suburbs. Still within the metro, so we're not covering the whole uh, Paris region. And that was, uh, that was not the most popular tour, uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, but when people were really, taking because this... because Montreuil is this eastern suburb that kind of has the feel of Brooklyn. It's got, like, all kinds of different uh, things. Yes, but mm -hmm. when you're traveling from Brooklyn to Paris, do you want to see Brooklyn again or do you want to see mm -hmm. Paris? Mm -hmm. And so people were... We, we realized we could get them to do this, and they were super happy doing that only if we were not telling them ahead. So it was a surprising day. You've done the Louvre, you've done Versailles, because uh, that's what you want to do when you come to Paris. It's also what is very specific to Paris. But they really enjoy getting to areas. I live in the 19th district, taking people to play pétanque uh, by the uh, Bassin de la Villette. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes the highlight of their trip. 
because that's not the one thing they expected to mm. tick out of a, uh, uh, a list, uh, but that's where they connect more with locals. Are they signing Stephen's petition to make it an Olympic sport? We need to talk about it. <laughs> All <after>. right. <laughs> uh, it, it, which brings us to the Olympics. Uh, it, there's going to be all kinds of transformations. They've said they're going to showcase the city. Uh, there's even going to be the long-distance swimming in the Seine. That's a big deal. In 1990, the then mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac, famously promised the Seine would soon be clean enough for him personally to swim in it. <laughs> According to the latest census, conditions in the Seine are suitable for more than 25 types of fish. So that's why I can affirm that we can make the river clean. And I've also said that in three years' time, I'll go swimming in the Seine to prove to you that it is clean. Alexandre Fort, did Jacques Chirac ever swim in the Seine? Never. Never. <laughs> it, it was a joke in the 90s in the French TV. It's when you asked to Jacques Chirac, how is the city? Uh, Jacques Chirac uh, mm. say, oh, grey and polluted as I want. <laughs> so uh, the city changed totally in 25 years, and Jacques Chirac never do what he say for the municipality of Paris. He, wa he was a very bad mayor. He destroyed a lot of the Parisian patrimony. He destroyed a lot of the heritage. So he was not really the, the, the very good mayor we imagine. And he became president after. He was the first elected mayor in Paris. It, it, it's another point. And after that, the, the transformation of Paris starts really at the beginning of the 2000s, when Paris start to be a candidate for the Games. So we can say that it's correlated to a new ambition for Paris, not only to be the Paris Museographic Paris, but a new Paris with the Games as an enlightenment to, to show a, a new face. And will uh, Anne Hidalgo be able to swim in the Seine in 2024? She, she, yeah, she America? says that she, she will uh, be the first uh, elected mayor of Paris to swim in the Seine River next uh, year. Um, in fact, we, we saw that uh, last summer it was a problem when they tried to, to make some competition inside the Seine River because the works are not finished to control the water from the uh, storm uh, storm we can have in the summer yeah, in Paris. Yeah, there's been a big storm and there was yes, supposed to have a exactly. test event. And mm -hmm. the, so the we, they are building a basin now to, to make the polluted water in the basin and after to transform it in clean water, but the basin is not ready now. It will be ready in the next months. So if there is not a huge storm and the climate change is not so hard now, uh, but perhaps in 10 years, the change, things will change. Right. And in go we'll, we'll swim in Paris. All right, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll be watching for that. Uh, for some cities like Barcelona, uh, hosting the games transformed the host city in ways that were much needed. Uh, in the case of Paris, which uh, promised sustainable games, there's been a lot of attention to making sure that uh, <clears throat> uh, big infrastructure projects don't become abandoned white elephants when the Olympic flame uh, goes out uh, on August 11th. Uh, Alexandre, a, a word on that? Have they done a good job in delivering what they've promised, which is things that are not going to be used once and then never again? The map is a, is a little bit an illusion because they, they don't promise a lot. So the only thing they build is the Olympic Village, uh, the Aquatic Center in Saint-Denis, and uh, some of uh, investment in uh, in competition and training center. But it, it's perhaps uh, the first game to uh, to propose nothing very large in terms of heritage. So it's it's a good way to say uh, we, we we will uh, achieve uh, the, the liberation of the game uh, because if you don't have to build a lot, you don't have to to to, to be worried about when you finish. So Bertrand Dalmont. Um uh, we've seen uh, the huge construction in uh, Seine-Saint-Denis, that northern suburb of Paris, where a lot of the events are taking place, uh, new tramway lines, um, th this sort of thing, a, a new aquatic center next to the uh, National Stadium. Um, what about in Paris? When you go on your tours, are you seeing is Paris changing at the, uh, as the games get closer in preparation, or is it still the same old city? It's changing, um, I would say, especially in terms of transit, having way more less cars uh, and it feels like there's way more traffic too but um, it's the one thing that I think in the city center changes the most is all this access for uh, bicycles and more pedestrian areas especially in the area where there will be uh, competitions events. Madeline Schwartz? Well, I actually just had the misfortune of learning how to drive in Paris, and let me tell you, that made me understand some people who I might other, not otherwise agree with, uh, because driving in Paris is extremely difficult, and for a hugely centralized country, everyone has their own interpretations of the rules of the road. Um, it's very fascinating, because when I think you're walking down the street, you don't necessarily realize how many potholes and construction sites and people in the middle of the street there are. And, 
um, and bike lanes that uh, sometimes stick very close to the sidewalk, but sometimes are right in the middle of the street for, you know, and suddenly appearing in this way. Um, the mayor has made green transit uh, a, a large part of her platform, um, and it has really changed the way that people circulate in the city. I was going to say, what, what does this map inspire you when you when you look at it, and your your thoughts about, you know, the the all the events that are going to be taking places, all these different places. Uh, in some cases, they're, uh, uh, like for instance, there's going to be the fencing at uh, the, the Grand Palais, which is one of the, 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 the beautiful uh, uh, Belle Epoque uh, uh, monuments of this city. Well, I think uh, one thing that is, uh, you know, both exciting and a little bit terrifying looking at this map is how, how dense the city is and how densely people will be in in the city when you think about 15 million people coming to a very small geographic area where, you know, even on a normal Wednesday, it's quite hard to get around. Uh, it will, it remains to be seen what, what moving around will be like during the Olympics. I've been hearing from friends and colleagues who are being told that they're actually asked not to come into the office for the whole period of the Olympics in order to make sure that the, the tourists can move around. All right, with the coming onslaught, many natives are making plans to head for the hills. Every year, my husband asks for a transfer to the south of France. We want to leave Paris. We had 55 square meters in a Paris suburb, and now we have 130 with a big garden. We had no garden before. I was born in Paris, so it's been kind of a shock for me. But in the end, everything went fine. Uh, so that's, that's the feeling about living in Paris. Uh, some are saying they're going to leave. Stephen Clark, are you going to cash in on your uh, years of living in Paris and uh, rent out your home in, as an Airbnb and go as far away as possible? Well, no, because if you rent your place, there, you have to tidy it up. So I don't, you know, I don't think I'll be doing that. Um, no, I mean, it's true that um, everything we hear about Paris, the Olympics, makes us want to leave the city. I mean, it is true that they're, they're going to be putting on a lot more metros, a lot more buses. They've put a huge bus station near the Olympic Village because to get the athletes in and out and around the city is going to be complete chaos. Um, they, they're actually saying that part of the motorway leaving Paris, between Paris, the north of Paris and the, and the Olympic Village, is going to be closed to normal traffic. It's going to be utter chaos. Um, but then, you know, they don't want people to drive. You know, Paris doesn't want people to drive, learning to drive a car. You know, it's insanity. You know, cars are the least welcome things in Paris, you know, at the moment. And, and everyone knows, you know, forever, that the only rule of driving in Paris is I'm going where I want to go, get out of my way. You know, and red light, OK, what does the red light know about my life? It doesn't understand me, I'm going. You know, pa driving in Paris is... You make it sound like Cairo, Stephen. No, it's worse, probably. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, I've never been to Cairo, but, you know, <laughs> driving in Paris is utterly terrifying um, and always has been and is getting worse. So taking public transport during the Olympic Games, they've made a huge effort, it has to be said. You know, the, um, this Line 14, which is an automatic line, so there are, no, there are never strikes, is being extended up to the Olympic Village. The only trouble is they promised two other lines which haven't yet been mm. built. So there's going to be one way of getting between the Olympic Village and Paris. And I think that is the biggest problem, that Paris said we're having the Paris Olympics, but the poor athletes are going to be 10 kilometers outside. And some of them are going to think, hey, I can jog into Paris from here. But you're going to be jogging through some of the toughest neighborhoods in the city area. So I, what I'm saying to them is if you win a gold medal, don't put it on when you're jogging because you're going to lose it. You know, and it's, it's close to Paris, but it's not close to Paris because we Parisians, we hardly ever venture outside the, you know, the périphérique unless we're going to the airport or we're on a train. You know, so it, Paris is tiny and it's going to get full of people. They reckon 600,000 people per day are going to be moving around just from one event to another. So, so Bertrand Dallemont, are, are you uh, uh, shutting shop during the games or are you... Uh, Not at all. Or are you, <laughs> t t tell us, are you fully booked? Um, we are getting m many, many bookings, uh, more than we expected. We thought of maybe closing, uh, but actually... Um, I mean, for now, we only see the traffic and the, the work, the construction work, etc. But we have to say also that the city is getting much cleaner. All the buildings are getting a new uh, facelift. Mm. And it's going to be very exciting to see all these people uh, going around the city, see all these events. It's maybe the chance of Paris is to have so many events in the core of the historic city. And I think I want to see that.
All right, mobility, as Stephen Clark was saying, a big issue uh, both during and after the games. Uh, some of those new metro lines. This is this is a shot of Line 15, which is coming in if you're. Uh, uh, if you know your subway maps by heart, um, uh, metro maps by heart. Uh, Alexandre Fort, and this gets to the heart of what your, uh, your upcoming book is about. Yeah, it's always that question of uh, what, will ha what will be the legacy afterwards uh, of these games? Uh, the, the, these, these new uh, public transport lines, is that going to be the, the legacy or will there be uh, <laughs> there is no legacy. In fact, only the Olympics. Because the Olympic there. Village is going to be in Lille Saint Denis, which yes. is which is uh, one of these working class neighborhoods that uh, saw rioting recently. It's it's very important to to make in context to, to put in context what happened for the games in Paris. So, uh, so the Paris games, there is no promises for for uh, legacy in terms of transportation system, in terms of accommodation. There is not a lot. We imagine to have huge uh, works like in Barcelona, but it's it's the contrary. Paris uh, bid was. Made made on the, the way to not building. So uh, the, the transportation system was approved in 2010, four years before the candidature of Paris. Were so you surprised that the IOC said yes? Because the Olympic, the, the, the International the Olympic Committee, they like big, big buildings with procurement, big the, spending. Before 2013 and the reform of the IOC agenda 20, 2020, um, it was no rules. So everybody, do what they want with the game. So London built a lot in Stratford. It was not really, uh, uh, it, it was in fact a little fail like the Olympic Village uh, around and the Olympic Stadium. London have a bad heritage because they have, it's not including inside a city strategy for long terms. What made Paris different is they try only to build uh, the, 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 the swimming pool uh, that will be in, in, in Saint-Denis in a way to implement new public services in the suburbs. And they say the other things we don't build. We do accommodation in the Olympic Village, but it represents only 4,000 or 5,000 uh, 5, uh, new accommodation. But Paris is building now between 70,000 and 100,000 accommodation by year. So it's, it's a kind of a, a very little things. And what happened in the suburb of Paris, in Paris, the transformation of the suburb of Paris is perhaps one of the most important transformation of a global city in our days. And that's a big point. And, and the Olympic Games is just a, a little thing inside. You've been investigating the transformation of the suburbs, Madeline Schwartz. Your thoughts on whether these games will have a positive impact? Well, I think in the immediate aftermath of the, of the games, you know, the most biggest feeling that will be felt, no doubt, uh, across Paris is a feeling of emptiness syndrome because we've had uh, the World Cup, the Rugby World Cup, then the Games, the Paralympic Games. When all of these people leave, it's going to feel, you know, like a big sigh of, of relief for many Parisians. But in the long term, yes, this is all part of a big transformation of the Paris area of thinking about Paris not only as the city center but as a larger metropolis that brings together the 131 commun uh, communities and towns around Paris into something much larger, what um, geograph geographers like to call Le Grand Paris, so the big Paris. The and greater the, Paris. And the greater Paris. So thinking about Paris not as, you know, the city center that we all know and have such clear images of, but as a much more thriving, larger, vibrant urban area. All right, and uh, there's uh, Parisians last month uh, rolling uh, their uh, their eyes uh, uh, over uh, authorities announcing, uh, Stephen Clark alluded to it, a price surge of single-use public transport tickets during the games, as well as special permits needed for residents, this is for you, Madeline, to drive their cars in the city center. Complaints dismissed by the mayor. So yes, some people will focus on the constraints and they'll be real. I wouldn't want to minimize it. But still, this moment at a time when everybody is obsessing over their little identity, sorry, their grand identity, and focus on all the conflicts around us with a pessimistic view of how the world is going, I think can only make us feel better. So stay in Paris. I wouldn't want to minimize it, but... No, no, I think, first of all, she needs to buy some moisturizer for her male, um, for her male assistants, because they, they seem to have skin problems while, they, while they're listening to her. Um, but apart from that, no, the, the, the big problem is, of course, that the mayor of Paris doesn't control Paris transport. It's a completely independent system run by someone who is, in fact, her political opponent. So 
obviously they're going to be, you know, rivals. And um, it is a big shock, I think, for non Parisians who were, pu who were promised, I think, free transport um, during the Olympics to find out they're going to be paying double the normal price for a trip on a very crowded train. Um, that, but then Paris Transport says it's calculated the numbers of people who are going to come, how much it's going to cost them, and so the, the, the ticket price will represent the real cost of transport. And quite frankly, even at four euros, or I can't remember, it's like 16 euros a day or something like that, that's still cheaper than London. So, you know. Bertrand Allemand. I would just want to ask that this, the, the, this price for the metro tickets is going to be if you buy tickets one by one. But if you have a monthly pass, uh, we You'll were told fine. that it will stay the same. All right. Um, again, it's a moment to reflect on the games. And the games are, it's been 100 years for this city. 1924, first games with an Olympic village. U.S. swimmer Johnny Weissmuller became such a hit that he later starred in Tarzan movies. In athletics, the Flying Finns dominated the long distances. And while Britain's Harold Abrahams and Eric Little took golds in the sprints as chronicled in the 1981 film Chariots of uh, Fire, uh, we're all uh, wondering, uh, is there going to be any kind of Alexandre Fort a nod to 1924? We know the field hockey is going to take place in the Chariots of Fire Stadium. Uh, what, what do you think about the fact that it's exactly 100 years? Uh, it's evidently, it's a very symbolic, and the Paris 2024 organization committee is very proud to come back in Paris for the Games 100 years after 1924, but also one, 130 years after uh, the refoundation of the Games by uh, Pierre de Coubertin uh, in, in the Sorbonne uh, University. So there is a lot of symbolic. You, you will have uh, the image of this symbol with the Grand Palais. We speak about the Grand Palais was built uh, next to the, to, the, to the first Olympic Games. And uh, at the time, uh, the games were uh, associated to the Expo World Expo World Fair, and uh, the first mega event was the World Fair, and not the Olympic Games. And the games start with the World Fair, and we came back to uh, the monuments of the World Expo, like Eiffel Tower, uh, Grand Palais. So the imaginary of Paris was always, and for the modern time, associated with mega events. And we came back with these mega events for a long time ago, but we came back in the place where where ancient mega events happen. So it's a, it's a continuation of the history, in fact. Madeline Schwartz, uh, when people, when you evoke the 2024 Olympics with people who are not in Paris, do they think about 100 years ago? Uh, or do they think about uh, a city uh, that's uh, rebounding after the terror attacks more recently? Um, I think they, for, from my own experiences, they mostly are very jealous not to be able uh, to, to be here, here for the events. And I think that, you know, those who live in Paris for, forget that maybe the biggest sport in Paris is complaining about Paris. But for people outside of the city, you know, the idea of all of these athletes coming to, to this world city, competing in, in great monuments, uh, many people are jealous not to be able to come. Uh, Paris is, remains a very attractive destination. What's the legacy of 1924, Stephen Clark? Um, well, I, I actually am thinking more about the legacy of 1900. You know, in, in 1900, the swimmers swam in the Seine. And at that time, there was, there was no clean water program at all. So they all, must have been a very hardy bunch. Either that or they all died the following year. I don't know. But, but um, it, this year, I think it's going to be huge to see swimmers swimming in the Seine. And it's going to feel very, very old school. You know, it's, there's something sort of primeval about swimming in the, doing the long distance swimming in the city's river. You know, London never did it. Well, mainly because it's a tidal river, so they would have all drowned anyway. But, but you know, Paris, it's going to be very big to see the, that swimming. I mean, I don't envy them because the water's not clean yet. But I do envy them. I mean, when you live in Paris, one thing you want to do on a hot day is jump in the, in the Seine. And apparently, the, the big legacy for us is going to be in tw from 2025. They've promised us, and this time they've, they've put 1.4 billion euros into the project which is basically enough to buy a swimming pool for every single Parisian. They've put 1.4 billion euros into cleaning up the water. And apparently afterwards, we Parisians are going to be able to go and swim in the Seine thanks to the Olympics. So, you know, that will be a big legacy. Yeah, Par Parisians feel orphaned since the, uh, the, 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 the Piscine d'Erigny, uh, which uh, <laughs> that, that open air swimming pool on the Seine, the one that's mm -hmm. featured in Life of Pi, uh, burnt down. So uh, I guess the, the swimming in the Seine is one thing. But your, your thoughts, 
especially with your tours, when you past and present, how does the Olympics legacy feel and fit into it? Well, the, the thing is, the it's uh, what you said is the the Olympics will be taking place mostly in buildings that were built not for that, and it's it's great to see that we can use these old buildings for modern day events. And that's probably one legacy that maybe does not appear as a legacy, but is to show that Paris of the past is also Paris of present and future. All right, and that brings us to a segment where we've asked our panel as we look ahead to 2024 uh, to th think about books or movies that uh, might r sort of reflect what is the spirit of Paris. And you actually delved quite far into the past, uh, the, <laughs> probably the most famous student of the Sorbonne University, dating all the way back to the Middle Ages, the poet François Villon. Mm -hmm. It's me. No. Yes. Oh, that's you. I didn't call. I'm sorry. <laughs> of course. I got my I got my sheets wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Alexandre Sorry. Faure, I'll begin with you then. Yes. So François Villon, why I propose this book? It's uh, when you look at this uh, this uh, what François Villon do 500 years ago in Paris, he do exactly what young people do today. So they are in a band, they are in the city, they always fight with the police, they try to go to the bar, they don't have money, they find a way to pass the time. <coughs> And finally, it's exactly what we can see in the movie La Haine uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, made in France about uh, what are young people from the suburbs doing in Paris. It's uh, not so far from, uh, from this. And this book reminds us how uh, things didn't change so fast. So uh, we, we don't have to think that everything was revolutioned in 500 years. Uh, what people think about the city is to have access to the services and also to regroup with their own and uh, perhaps sometimes to do stupid things or to do nice things. But uh, it's always like that when you live in the cities and Paris didn't change for that. Right. There's a mystery over whatever happened to François Villon. He, he was uh, several times due to be hanged for his yeah. naughtiness and... Uh, we don't know how uh, his life ended quietly. That was, uh, so I'm sorry, I, 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 you, you looked like a deer in a headlights a moment ago when I got my sheets wrong there. Uh, Bertrand Dalmont, yours are more classic portrayals of Paris. Yes, well, I, it's probably due also to uh, my job, which is to show the, uh, the, the past of Paris and reveal it. Uh, but I chose the, uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame and Belle Ami, which are covering two different uh, moments of Paris. It's medieval core uh, with the construction uh, of Notre Dame Cathedral and the medieval life around it. And it's very accurate still today since we're rebuilding the roof. And Belle Ami, which is more the evolving society, this new society of Paris, late 1800, turn of the century, uh, where many of the buildings we've talked about are being built and how the city is constantly changing in a way. Uh, 2023 is the 100th anniversary of uh, the uh, uh, no, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame movie with Lon Chaney. And so I'm wondering your thoughts on the fact that they're rebuilding the, the roof of Notre Dame and they're making it exactly like before. Some want to change. Would, do you think it was a good idea to, to rebuild it the way it is? Or Totally, yes. I was very, very nervous that they would not rebuild it as it was. Uh, but I think it's what, uh, what was to be done. All right, we've been talking in our conversation about uh, the Paris of the city centre and the Paris outside the city centre. Madeleine Schwartz, your focus is on books written by the, 20, the 2022 Nobel Literature Prize winner. Yes, I chose two books by Annie Arnaud, who won um, the Nobel Prize for Literature last year. Uh, Annie Arnaud has been based for a long time in Sergi Pontoise, which is one of the so-called new cities that was built uh, post-war outside, um, outside of Paris, and that city uh, really has the focus, is, is the backdrop to a lot of her work, including two books that I selected here, Journal de Dehors and La Vie Extérieure. I think so much of these games are about showing the Paris that's outside of Paris, and that is something that Agnano has been doing her whole career, and uh, people who are coming and want to get a different view of, the, of France's capital would do well to start with her work. All right, there are those who want Paris to look towards the past. We began with Alexandre Falls uh, 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 evoking uh, the continuity between the Middle Ages and, and the poet François Villon. Uh, Stephen Clark, in the 1970s, there was a movie that tried to be futuristic, a comedy. Yeah, Un Grand Blanc 
avec Tall Blonde Man with One Black Shirt. Yeah, um, which is one of the most joyous French comedies you can possibly imagine. It's just pure fun, um, complete farce, complete nonsense. It's the French making fun of themselves, which they quite rarely do, actually. Um, and, you know, making fun of their secret services. It's kind of a fake James Bond film. Uh, it, um, it tries to be, as you say, very modernistic. And uh, it's just incredibly funny. And it's the French, I think it's Parisians doing what they ought to do a lot more, which is just having fun living in the city. Uh, you, you know, you see a lot of the cityscapes in the film and you just see these completely quirky characters Um, it's just pure fun. Nothing to do with the Olympics whatsoever. It's just when when I was asked, you know, to choose something, I chose this purely because it's um, it's fun. All which right. which living in Paris should be just fun, you know. Should be in, indeed, and uh, it is a it is a classic. The 1972 Tall Bomb for One Black Shoe. Well, it's going to be an interesting 2024, and it'll be a sporting one in more ways than one. Stephen Clark, I want to I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, as well uh, Bertrand Dalmont, uh, Alexandre Fort, Madeleine Schwartz. Uh, thank you, and thank you for being with us throughout the year, right here on France 24.